everyone, we're really glad you're with us this morning to, to wrap up with this panel. Uh, my name is Grayson Com. I'm a reporter for 10 News in the Tampa Bay area. Um, my wife's a guardian ad litem and was a special assaults prosecutor in Jacksonville before we moved to Tampa. So I've got a lot of personal love for this. Uh, our parent company, Gannett, very much cares about what happens in the state. So I'm here representing 10 News in Tampa Bay, but also First Coast News in Jacksonville, the Fort Myers News Press, Florida Today in Brevard County, the Pensacola News Journal, and the Tallahassee Democrat. All of us really care about kids, like you all do, and so I'm excited to be part of this panel. I have a really amazing panel that I'm gonna introduce to you guys in just a second. I do wanna start off just with a thought. The good news is, that so many of you guys get to make a difference in the lives of kids, very vulnerable kids, every day. The bad news is, that is not easy. But that's actually good news, uh, because it's a challenge, and we all get to be here figuring out solutions for it. We get to be the people who write that next chapter, who solve that next problem, who tackle that next issue, and that is awesome, because that's really powerful. So I wanna thank you guys for all being part of it, with this panel. I'm gonna introduce you to them in a minute, but first I wanna introduce you to a child who we're gonna show you in a video, and I want us to think as we watch this, how do we as a system focus on what this child needs and what's best for this child? In my first few years of fostering, that's all I took were either infants, newborns. And in particular, when I had this girl who came in at six months, I had her for a year. Um, she had other siblings in the system who I maintain uh, visitations with. Um, when she was 18 months, I got the news that a family member had come into the picture, which was great. I mean, I, I was happy that there were people that were part of her family who wanted to see her, who wanted to meet her, they were from out of state. They made arrangements to travel, which I thought was great. I made a whole album with the pictures from her birthday that we had just had a few months prior to, um, to give it to them. I gave them my phone number. I tried to you know, keep a communication over the phone so the girl can get to know them, so I could introduce them. And knowing that the outcome could be that she could possibly be placed there. In the process, um, Somewhere along the process, in court, it was decided that she was going to be going to a visit out of state with people she had never met, with people she had never seen, with people that she had no knowledge of, because she was 18 months. It doesn't matter how much I try to tell her, she was 18 months. Um, I was pretty much told tomorrow she's going to Virginia, and that was the end of the case. I asked, can I take her? Can we go? What, you know, how does that work? Like, it was pretty much, we'll pick her up at 11. Have her ready and we'll pick her up at 11. I said, for how long? And I said, well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be an extended visit, so it's going to be a month. After a month, we'll bring her back. Um, it, anybody that has children knows that at 18 months of age, they're very attached. They usually don't like strangers. They are clingy to mom. They, you know, they don't talk. You know, they barely know how to walk and get around. <laughs> they don't have communication. They don't have the understanding that a 12-year-old would, if anything. Um, that morning, I cried as I got her ready. I had packed a little luggage with enough clothing for what I thought maybe two weeks where it's a, they had diapers, some of their you know, snacks and things that she liked, her teddy bear, her blanket. Um, but I didn't send everything because I was told she was coming back in a month. I was told it was, was a visit and they wanted her to meet them and spend some time with them and there was no better way of doing it but to send her off for a visit. Um, I had to try to prepare the best I could my children to, to know that she was going to be gone for a little bit. Five years later, that little bit never ended. Um, I never even got the courtesy of getting a phone call back to let me know that she was not coming back. For months, I tried to inquire, and I was told I was not privileged to the information because I was no longer part of the case plan. Um, I still had things that belonged to her, shoes, clothing, toys, 
My children ask consistently, when is she coming? What is she, you know, I had no answer because I really didn't have an answer. When she was picked up that day, the caseworker who saw her once a month picked her up. And although she could not completely comprehend what was happening, she was very anxious. She cried from the time that I left, her, that I opened the door and the caseworker picked her up all the way till she got in the car. All she kept saying was mommy and kept going like this. I'll never get that out of my head. It took over a year for me to take another placement because I could not get over the lack of communication, the lack of caring, the lack of planning, the lack of people's understanding that these are not toys, that children are people, that we are people, that it doesn't just affect that one child. I had another four children in my house that I had to explain this to without having an explanation for. Um, I have to say that was probably one of the worst. And the, she might never have been able to express what she felt, but I can only imagine that she had no clue either. So to say the least, that you know, it, it, it's, it's trying to put ourselves in their shoes and trying to think of what they would feel when this happens and what that looks like and who gets impacted by those changes. I want to start with Stephen Pennypacker, who's the CEO of Partnerships for Families. And Stephen, the, the question, does the law require that course of action? The short answer is no. I don't think the law requires that. Uh, sprinkled throughout Chapter 39, there are references to relatives being considered for placement, identifying relatives throughout the course of the case. But when it comes time to make a change of placement, we have a statute that expressly addresses this situation. It's Florida Statute 39.521, Section 1D, 8B, and I'm going to read it. It says, if no suitable relative is found and the child is placed with the department or a legal custodian or other adult approved by the court, both the department and the court shall consider transferring temporary legal custody to an adult relative approved by the court at a later date, and this is the critical phrase, but neither the department nor the court is obligated to so place the child if it is in the child's best interest to remain in the current placement. And clearly what the legislature is saying is that DNA does not trump a child's best interest. So in hearings where we are considering that change of placement, we need to be looking at best interest, not simply the relation between the child and the uh, prospective placement as far as biology. I think that leads well to April Lott, uh, Behavioral Health Specialist with Direction for Living. April, uh, we talk about blood, and you think of that being the, the DNA being the, the key link, but in terms of when it comes to attachment and children, what other things do we need to be considering, both from the perspective of your temporary caregiver, who needs to be a temporary parent, and then also someone who's intended to become that permanent caregiver? You know, the, the best interest of children really is preserving their attachment ties to whoever they are attached to. So. You know, in this video, you know, whether this, this child should have been moved at all is in question. Uh, and if she needed to be moved, uh, how that transition actually occurred. And, and understanding that every time we break a uh, relationship tie, uh, there is a trauma. Uh, and at some point, that becomes an acute trauma uh, that will later have very significant uh, issues uh, present very significant issues for, for, for children as they grow up. And, and what the research is really showing us about the, the development of the brain is that we might not see that at uh, six months or 18 months in this case. We might begin to actually see that at four years and six years and, and 12 years as that trauma changes with that child's development. So really we need to be uh, thinking, you know, we always need to start with the end in mind. Uh, with, with this child. What is in the best interest of this child isn't always uh, some of the rules that, that we've often heard about, which is that siblings have to stay together or that it's always best that they remain uh, with, their, uh, with their relative or that they go to a relative. Uh, we really do need to consider uh, the emotional connection, the depth of that relationship to that caregiver uh, and that we're always thinking about the process and the transitions 
uh, that that child is going to go through. And you're saying the research, uh, when they're six months or 18 months, when they don't remember anything that happens to them, the research is showing that does then rear its head later on. Absolutely. And in fact, you know, when you think about uh, children in the child welfare system really represent a very small uh, amount of children compared to all the children in the, in the world. But when you look at the number of children who are experiencing things like homelessness and, and teenage pregnancy and drugs and substance abuse uh, issues and uh, all of those kinds of, of things, the majority of them are actually coming from these kinds of broken uh, attachment bonds and, and relationships and from foster care. We need to be careful we're not adding more traumas onto the scorecard exactly. for this kid, this lifetime exactly. record. Very interesting. We have another video we want to show you that's going to further bring along our discussion. We went to court one morning, not expecting any kind of transition or move to happen, and the judge ordered our kids to be moved right away. And so, of course, my first question was, well, can we at least wait till after school? This was like 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning. And we were told, no, you need to pick up the kids immediately from school, and we're going to go ahead and make that move. So, um, you know, first I want you to remember, think about the trauma these kids have already experienced. Um, they've already had loss in their, in their lives. And in our home, I, I always try to let the kids know in the morning, listen, today's going to be a different day. You're not going to go to school all day. You have a doctor's appointment at 1 o'clock. I'm going to be picking you up at 12. We do this with every single child because of the experiences they've already had in their home. This day I wasn't going to be able to do, to do that. I go to the school and I won't forget the day that I see um, the children coming down the hallway with their friends. And of course the, the oldest says, why are you picking me up today? Why are you picking me up today? And of course I, I pause for a minute and I'm like, what do I say to her? Um, and I said, you know, you're, you were, I'm actually taking you home today. And in the middle of the hallway, she starts screaming and crying. By the way, this was to a relative. In fact, I had told her, you're, you know, you're going with your grandparents today. Um, her little brother was next to her coming out of the side hallway with another friend. And he starts crying because she starts crying. The emotional impact was obviously the trauma, the crying, the not understanding why her life was being turned upside down again. Okay. Um, so then we rush home because our house is actually a mile away from the courthouse. So of course we're rushing home. The two kids are crying in the back seat. And we're rushing around our house to try to get all their clothes and everything <coughs> packed. Not taking the time to sit down and talk to them about what this transition was, where they were going, why it was important, why it should be a good thing. Instead we're worrying about packing. Um, our daughter was also at school that day. She didn't get to say goodbye. How many foster parents do you think would stick around for that? Um, today, actually, we were on our, I was dropping her off. She's in middle school now. This was a couple years ago, and I asked her what that transition was like for her. And she said, I didn't get to say goodbye. So I want you guys to think about that. How many foster parents would be willing to stick around when the kids in their home are affected? Not just, not just us, because we're the adults, but the kids. And that's obviously compelling. You know, maybe it is in the best interest long term of that child to have that child placed with that relative. But it seems like the trick there is making it a transition, not a trauma. And that's the challenge. Uh, I want to bring in uh, the Honorable Catherine Esrig, who's a 13th uh, Circuit judge in the Tampa Bay Area Dependency Court. And judge, what do you as a judge or general magistrate need to consider when you are making these huge, significant, life-changing choices? Well, obviously, the law tells us in making a modification of placement, as you just heard um, Steve Pennypacker read, is what's in the child's best interest. But it's important, as a judge or a general magistrate, considering a case and a child and a family, um, to consider everything and how it's impacting the child. So that the first question is, is this the right placement? Are you going to, to order that the child be moved to a relative, such as the grandparent? But if so, how is that transition going to take place? And it's incumbent upon us, the court, to make sure that these changes occur in a way that causes hopefully no harm or as little harm as, as possible. And we now know you don't just say, I'm ordering reunification or I'm ordering a modification of placement right now. 
Um, you take into consideration how long has the child been in this home? Are there emotional attachments to foster siblings, to, to um, classmates, to teammates, to teachers, to scout leaders, to what have you? Um, it can be a very slow transition. It can be done gradually with visits before the child's actually moved. Um, you know, we, we hopefully all in the system have learned that, and there was a time where, where this was not uncommon. Um, we've hopefully all learned, however, that this, this isn't the way to do things. And, and we as judges have learned, I hope, that when we say immediate re reunification, um, that we don't mean you go and you grab a child from school and you don't give him or her the opportunity to say goodbye. I hope it also um, resonates with the courts that you need to take into consideration um, in considering whether a placement is in a child's best interest. Is it a placement where the child's well-being is going to be considered? Is it a placement that's going to openly welcome and encourage the child no matter who he or she is or what his or her beliefs, um, sexuality, ideas, religious beliefs, et cetera, are. Um, I think it's, it's really important to take all of these things into consideration in fashioning the right placement and the right transition into that placement. Is there a, a tendency toward, in some judges, some cases, more the yank off the Band-Aid, get it done now, get it done fast kind of thing? Or uh, is that really, in your experience, pretty much always the wrong move? In my experience, that's always the wrong move. And I hope that we've gotten to the point where, where no one, no matter how busy they are, no matter how big their caseloads are, no matter how many people are waiting out in the hallway for hearings there are, would do that. Appreciate it. Thank you, Judge. Uh, uh, another question related to this. Ginger Griffith, Family Safety Manager for the Department of Children and Families. It's a small organization. You guys may have heard of it. Um, Ginger, from this video, we can really see the importance of attachment bonding, uh, both this video and the last video. How does the safety methodology really assess a child's individual needs through this lens of attachment bonding? So I'm so glad you asked that question. The majority of the time when we think about safety methodology, the first thing that comes to mind is this focus on safety, and that's absolutely important. But the safety methodology brings a whole other layer now around assessing individual well-being for children. And so it's taking information collection around um, how a child functions in their daily life and really informing 10 different well-being items that we haven't ever seen before. And it really goes beyond just making sure that they're getting their dental needs met and their medical needs met. Um, and their education needs met, but actually helps the worker assess in a very clearly defined way um, how the child is able to uh, regulate their emotions, how, what their trauma experiences, what their child development looks like, what do their peer relationships look like, what do their family relationships look like. Um, you talked about cultural identity, what does that look like? And it really helps the worker assess that in terms of a strength or a need, which of course is really important with helping align with service provisions to kind of meet those needs to strengths. But I think the other piece is that when you step back and look at all of those well-being items in the aggregate, you start to see some patterns. Um, we know children with attachment issues typically have issues around emotional regulation or behavioral issues or um, you know, not being able to make connections with families or peers. And if we have that information that we can now assess in a way that's meaningful and share that with our partners around that children and in that case, um, I think it becomes, it becomes to make a much larger impact. Um, and for the first time, I think we're going to be able to, as a state, have a state view and an understanding of the children that we serve, what those needs look like, what sort of service arrays that we need to build around them, and then even sort of look at outcomes in terms of that service connection. Um, are, are the services that we're providing to sort of improve these well-being issues um, that clearly can, can directly relate to attachment being improved by the service provisions that we're using? But as I mentioned, <laughs> um, attachment is a much more robust sort of assessment. It's much more complex. Um, and so even from a parent's sort of perspective in terms of, a set of attachment, the safety methodology addresses that as well. I mean, it looks at caregiver protective capacities, how they think and feel and act around protection. But in the emotional caregiver protective capacity, it even goes a little bit deeper. Um, it looks at what their um, attitudes are, what their feelings are, and how they identify with the child and actually scales um, how the parent is attached to the child, how they're aligned with the child. Um, and all of this is really built on good information collection around domains that we haven't collected historically very well before, child functioning, adult functioning, their parenting practices, and how they discipline. So it's pretty exciting stuff. I, I can't wait to see um, how case management agencies and the community-based care are able to use this to um, make sure that we're getting child well needs met. 
judge, if I can, how do you balance then that the less tangible attachments to the, hey, there are vermin in this house, safety aspects? How do you balance that? Well, and, and that's, that's a good question, and obviously it's not an easy thing to do. Well, that's why you're a judge. <laughs> but I think it really important for, for judges and general magistrates handling these cases from the outset to, to, to bring all of these issues to the forefront. Um, don't wait until six months down the road or a year down the road. Um, from the moment you get the case, inquire, and, and, and don't just inquire, are there relatives out there? Who are the relatives? Do, are they interested in being a part of this child's life? And it's not just a question of placement or no placement. It's do they want to be a contact? Do they want to be a resource? Do they want to be an important part of the child's life, even if for whatever reasons the child can't be placed with them? Um, so you need to ask those questions from the beginning. I bring them in. I, I, if someone says, oh, well, you know, we spoke with this particular relative and they're not in a position to take the child or they don't want to take the child. A lot of times I'll, I'll say, well, let's bring them to the next hearing. Let's talk about it with them. Let's find out what the issues are. Let's find out if it's something that we can resolve or help them resolve. Um, I think you need to, to really dig deeply into these cases because we have found, um, as I'm sure everybody in this room knows, it, a lot of times when you inherit a case, things were done at the outset that, that maybe we wouldn't do that way if the case were opening today. Um, we didn't always do the best job of bringing in relatives, and it's not always relatives. There are non-relatives. There are, there are neighbors. There are teachers. There are people who, who the child has had a, a relationship with of some sort that we need to inquire of. And we didn't always do that, and sometimes the, the notes in the file don't, don't give us the best picture. Of, of what is out there, um, of who is out there. So there's nothing wrong with, with you as the, the court saying, let's bring them in, let's find out, or let's go back. Just because somebody called them a year ago and, and they weren't in a position to, to be in the child's life, maybe that's changed. Maybe they've moved. Maybe they're geographically closer. Maybe their economic circumstances have changed. So I think it's important in order to make that proper balance, in order to weigh things, in order to really have the full picture, to ask those tough questions and to, to, to bring people to court if need be, pick up the phone and call them if need be. Get that gavel, use it. Exactly. Uh, and I think that leads well into the one more video we're gonna show, which is a very positive video, very uplifting. Uh, we're gonna show this video, but it talks about building a team. And that's what you're talking about. A team of agencies that can fit a particular need for a child. A team of people. You know, hey, maybe dad isn't really interested in taking him on as a, as a person, but maybe dad would love to take him to a ball game and trying to create that structure. So it's really interesting and it has played into a tremendous success in the next video we're gonna show you. I was in a group home, I was 17. I remember it was, it was in October. Cause I was, I was, I was just gonna turn 18, had two weeks left. And um, uh, my auntie, I call her my auntie, but she was uh, pretty much the supervisor of my case. We were real close, cause we've been together for so long. And she was like, you know, there's, there's this home, whatever. And I had a friend that stayed with them because they had adopt, already adopted one of my friends. You know, she was, she was real cool. She, you know, um, I went to my friend's birthday party, you know. Uh, we just hit it off because they have a big family. It was a family of eight, okay, eight, eight. And um, it was just real cool and you know, since then, you know, we just hit it off, and then um, we got the process done, you know, because I had people, you know, that just, just knew what they was doing, so we got the process done, like, I think two weeks, and then, when did I get adopted? I got adopted on the like, third, third of November, and, uh, and since then, I've been happy, you know, um, they actually encouraged me to go back, get back into school, because I was real far behind, I had, um, I was down nine credits uh, last year, and I didn't think I was going to make, I, was, I wanted to get my uh, GED or whatever. They encouraged me, and um, I got my high school diploma, you know, all A's and B's, you know, you know. Um, <laughs> then, um, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm in college now, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much, you know, this is my best transition that, I, uh, that I've gotten to so far. Wow, so Eric there adopted at 17 years and 11 months, uh, did not quit school, stayed with it, got his high school diploma, uh, because a team was involved, and you know, it's, we mentioned the judge earlier, These. Judges, and I'm sure you're like it, you grow up visioning, like, I get to decide the winner. I'm going to pound that gavel and pick that winner, and you get it, and you don't. And, you know, it's great 
when you do the type of law my wife does now, which is company fighting company. But when you're talking about kids, that's not really viewed as the right solution, but there are mindsets all the way back through law school that judges need to shake, and back through people who are passionate about justice, who get involved in this system, you have to shake. And I want to bring in, uh, I want to bring in Carol here. This is Carol Schofer. She's the founder of Quality Parenting Initiatives. And Carol, talk to me about teaming. And she's, that's fans. <laughs> Thanks, uh, a fan. <laughs> what does teaming mean? And, and talk to me about everyone's role in the case from the beginning and the end, and who should be involved in key decisions. So before I answer that, I do want people to know that that young man was adopted by the very first foster parent that you saw, so it has a happy ending there. And I'm so happy I get to do the happy ending part. What I think was really critical here was three really important things. His case manager, he said, had such a close relationship that he called her auntie. He had been in the system basically his whole life, and she had kept relationships attachment is what had kept him going and kept the light that Secretary Carroll talked about in him. Even all this time he was in group homes. Second, that when the team could get together, a prospective adoptive parent, the youth himself getting to say what he wanted, the social worker, everyone meeting together, we actually got a happy ending at a time when people would have thought this is over for him. And that's, I think, the best thing, that we could defy what the stereotype was, defy the it's blood, defy the it's a rule, he's 17 and 11 months and two weeks, it's too late for him, he doesn't really want a home, he's a teen, change what we think we know to see what did that specific child know and need. And it's amazing what the system finally did for him. Look at where he really wound up. So I hope that's answering your question about teamwork. It's just answering what I wanted to say, which is most <laughs> important to me. Well, then I'm going to follow up, because I'm a news reporter, and this is what I do. Um, how, do how do we make more Eric's? What, what are the things that need to come to the table and people that need to come to the table, mindset-wise, for all of us to pay attention to? to make more Eric's? So I think we need to do what Judge Esrig said, that is bring everyone who cares about that child and knows about the child to the table. So if you notice at the very beginning, Dania said, I wasn't in the case anymore, so I couldn't know anything. We cannot look at caregivers ever as being out of the case. There isn't a case, there's a child. They are in the child's life and we need to keep them in the child's life. So I think bringing all of those people and listening to them and setting aside, I thought it was wonderful what you just said. We're not all fighting. We're all on the same team for the same goal. And if we have different opinions, we have different opinions, but we're not enemies. Just like my children's father, grandparents, siblings, when we have a problem, we're talking about it together. When we disagree, we don't say it's because you're evil and you're selfish. We say, let's come up with a great solution. And I think that's what, what our children have, every child should have. Awesome. It's great. tough because sometimes though you feel like you're buried under the bureaucracy and you can't, and you got the paperwork and you got this deadline and you got this thing and you can't take the time. I, I, I had good fortune doing a lot of stories with Judge David Gooding up in Jacksonville. And he was the first person, he actually changed my life in kind of giving me the idea of nobody's going to stop you. And if you don't believe a judge is one of the most powerful people you ever meet, irritate one. <laughs> you can make anybody show up anywhere. It's like bewitched with the nose twitching. It's amazing. Uh, so I, I think that, it, but it, the trick is it falls to all of us because you've got a crazy caseload and you've got a crazy case. I feel like Oprah. You've got a crazy caseload. You've got a crazy caseload. But you do. So the trick is to have that person who can step back, take a deep breath, and say, you know what we really need? We need to delay this a month. We need to get these five people in here. His manager at the store he works needs to come in here and make it happen. So I think that's true, is you need that encouragement. Stephen, a quick legal question for you. The, the judges, the people involved, we have the power to do this, right? We're not Absolutely. trapped under the law. I, I echo what you just said. She has the power. The magistrates <laughs> have the power. Bring them in. So if you don't have to make that decision on that particular hearing and you need more information, continue it. Bring the right people in. And I want to say something else that I think Carol was trying to emphasize, and that is talk to the child. 
Um, we have the adults and we have the foster parents and relatives and whoever else is there and we're looking at it from that lens. We need to bring that child in. Somebody needs to talk to them. Even the 18-month-old, somebody needs to be expressing what that 18-month-old is going to be experiencing. And you don't look at it from just that decision today, is it the best thing today? I think you have to look at it long term. So that 18-month-old is going to have 16 and a half more years potentially with wherever you place them. You need to have somebody that's advocating for that 16 and a half years. Bring them all together. We're talking about you know, competing adult interests, and we're also talking about the best interests of the child. But there's, there's another dimension to this that I think adds something, and, and Loretta Shirley, who's the Chief of Program Services in Florida for Eckerd, uh, has something I think you can really address, and that's siblings. You know, there's a strong belief that siblings should really stay together at all times. We have a new law that kind of reinforces this relationship of siblings. Talk to me about your response for that from your experience. Okay, so it's not as black and white as the law is written. Um, a sibling relationship is often the longest lasting relationship that a child can have. And placing siblings together helps to preserve the emotional ties that either currently exist between that sibling group or have the potential to exist between a sibling group. Now, the law further defines a sibling, so it's not just a blood bond, it's not just DNA. So now we're challenged to look at siblings based on social relationships. For example, foster kids who've been raised in the same home as siblings, preserving those relationships. Now again, the law requires that we make reasonable efforts to place siblings together, unless it is not in each child's best interest to do so. And I wanted to share a brief scenario that really illustrates the intent of that particular law. Um, in a judicial circuit, and I'll keep the judicial circuit out, it will remain anonymous, <laughs> uh, but in a particular judicial circuit, we had a sibling group of four who were placed into the foster care system. The, um, the kids ranged in age from three years to 16 years. Now, the three youngest children, um, all under the age of seven, were able to be maintained in their foster home but their 16-year-old sibling had to be placed in a residential group care setting outside of the judicial circuit. Now, despite the efforts of well-intended professionals, um, a year had lapsed before they were able to identify a, a placement option for all four siblings. And at this time, there was a multidisciplinary staffing that had occurred and those well-intended professionals sat at a table and made a decision that they thought was in the best interest of the children, driven by the passion that all kids, the, the passion and the belief that all kids, no matter what, should be placed together, all siblings should be placed together. So, on the surface, it seems like it's a great ending to a story. The kids were separated for a year, now they're back together. But in this particular scenario, it was the worst thing that could have ever happened for that now 17-year-old teenager. Because what the professionals didn't talk about or who they didn't have at the table as part of teaming was the individuals that were involved in that 17-year-old's life. Because those individuals would have said, he is in his senior year of high school, I am the coach of his varsity football team, and I will tell you that there are scouts who are looking at him for ma at a major university for a major scholarship, and to disrupt him at this time will be the most detrimental thing that you could do long term for this child. And to Stephen Pennypacker's point, no one thought it was important enough to sit down with that 17-year-old and really talk through those options. So he was disrupted from his placement. He did go on to play um, college football, but for a smaller university. And I can assure you that if our role, as stated during an opening session by Secretary Carroll, is to protect the light inside of every child, helping it to burn brightly, then I can assure you in that scenario, we failed. So, I would challenge each and every one of you that when you leave this conference, if you, um, the, the one point that I want to stress more than any other point 
is that when you are talking about siblings being placed together, number one, well actually it's two points, uh, number one, don't forget about foster care siblings, okay? Kids who are raised in foster homes, years that are separated, keep that in mind, but also most importantly, um, when you make decisions about placement, keep in mind that the decision that you make the first time should be well thought out and believed to be the last decision for that child, and you have to make sure that your decisions are in the best interest of every individual child. So to your point, yes, it's great to place siblings together and we're obligated to do that, but unless it's in the best interest of every single individual <coughs> sibling, then we are not making the right decision. So. April, along those lines, can you talk at all about the psychology of that sibling relationship being foster siblings, half-siblings, buddies who've grown up together forever versus biological siblings. Those relationships, what's the similarity? There's a lot of similarity. It's, re it's really about the, uh, it's, a, it's about the attachment, it's about the bonding, it's about the shared experience, it's about the, you know, how they uh, are growing and developing in, 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 in a sh this shared experience that, that they have. So, Yes, there is DNA that, that certainly bonds many of us together, but all of us can think about the, you know, it takes this, this idea that it takes a village. I mean, we all remember, um, you know, our uh, playmates from when we were uh, little. Anybody who's ever had to move kind of suddenly and leave people behind, uh, you know, even, even young children who have uh, toys that they hold on to that they lose by accident, you know, it's... Uh, it's all of those kinds of, of relationships that then ultimately form how this, this child who will become an adult will form attachments and relationships moving forward. So there, there really is no scientific difference between a bonded relationship with a sibling in, uh, that is, that's not blo blood related in, in foster care than there is a, a regular sibling if they have those shared life experiences. All right, Judge, I'm sold. Let's do what's best for the kids. But it's, there's a lot of nuance to this. What would be a, key, a couple of key either people or pieces of, pieces of information that maybe you've started getting recently or that you wish you got or that have really made differences when trying to make these right decisions in your time? Well, and it's funny, as I was listening to April speak, the word connections kept popping up in my head. Um, just remember that every one of these children who whose lives you're making decisions about, all of us are making decisions about, um, have connections. And it needs to always be in the, in the forefront. What are those connections? How do we preserve those connections? Is, is whatever decision we're make or making or whatever movement the child is making um, done so with mindfulness of those connections? Um, and, and I think as the court, it's important at the very beginning, no matter, and, and we all know, nobody, nobody comes into this business, I think Secretary Carroll uh, in his opening speech spoke to this, nobody comes into this business because um, there's power, there's prestige, there's money. <laughs> it's the money, that's what it's that's about. That's what it's about. No, it's about the passion that each of us has um, for children <clears throat> and for families. And we all, every one of us, I truly believe, makes decisions in what you think is, is the best way. Nobody sets out to make a bad decision. Nobody sets out to make a bad move for a child or a bad placement for a child. Um, but I do think that sometimes our focus um, at the outset is different. We think, oh, the child's going home soon. As soon as we get these services in place, as soon as we clean up the house, as soon as mom gets a job, whatever the issues are, this child is going to be reunified, is going to go, go back home, and so this is just a temporary placement. But I think we always need to think of it as a permanent placement. If something were to go awry, if something were to change, is this the placement that is going to be the right placement long term for this child? And I think if you always are, are thinking in that way, then you do take into consideration these connections. If you think of it, oh, he or she's only going there for just a short time, we're really working on just moving them back home, you don't think of it in the same way. So even though that's always often the goal, and even though that hopefully will happen, I think your placement decisions, where the child's going to be placed, 
how they're going to transition into that placement, who's going to remain a part of their life, who's going to be visiting with them, should always be done with an eye towards, if this lasts forever, is it the right placement? Is it the right connections? Are those connections being maintained? This is not their temporary home. This is their next home. This is their current home. And then home. what's going to be their next home after that? And, and yeah. I think that would fall in line with helping to minimize that trauma if you, mm -hmm. if you, spra if you spread it out. Exactly. Um, I've noticed some people looking like they might have a thought to add. I know, Carol, you don't ever chime in. So, uh, but I, I feel like you, you might have a point here that, is there a point we've talked about that you want to kind of add a little bit to? Well, I think this importance, I really like what you said about their permanent home, but I also think for those of you who saw Rent, no day like today, every day for this child is their only childhood. So we can't just keep on looking at, yes, but what will it be like in five years, 10 years? They won't be three again. They won't be four again. They need to be in a loving, committed relationship every single day of their life. So I don't think blood can take precedence over that loving, committed relationship. I think who do they care about, who cares about them is what a child cares about. I want to loop back, or do you want to no, add? No, well, I, I just wanted to add to the point that was made by um, April Lott and Judge Ezrick regarding connections to foster kids. And I just want to share um, a story that a foster child shared with us that literally changed the way I viewed uh, siblings. And in this particular scenario, the, there were seven foster siblings that had been in a home for multiple years before that foster home had to be closed. And in those multiple years, those children had bonded no differently than how we would bond as siblings with our, with our own sisters and brothers. So when the system had to shut down that foster home, there was no thought given to preserving the emotional ties of those foster kids who had been raised together for multiple years. So many of them had different social workers and all of them went on to be placed in other foster homes. And that is the key that we're trying to drive home with regard to the attachment and the emotional ties. And we deal with those type of scenarios each and every day. And I just want to reiterate the importance of making sure that moving forward, even when you're dealing with foster siblings, that you're keeping in consideration, not making decisions in a vacuum, but keeping in consideration that emotional bond and tie. We talk about having a transition instead of a trauma. Because you are moving these kids. And you're going to move them. If it ends up coming back home, you're moving them again. Um, who here has an experience or a thought on a situation where maybe a trauma was turned into a transition or something was averted or a better outcome was created so you don't have the 9 a.m. pull them out of class and take them to Vermont situation? Who here, can anyone think of a situation or just something to consider when they're doing that? Hmm. I can make something up. I guess. <laughs> well, I, oh, I think every day we see excellent transitions happening they happen because the team gets together, decides, yes, this is the appropriate thing, or at least we can agree that this is how, what is going to happen. And then rather than, I, the case that you saw is the absolute worst case scenario, but making everyone as a team say, how is this going to work best? I. I can't see out in the audience, but I'm sure if I could, I would see foster parents who have had relatives come and stay in their homes for days at a time in order to get to know the child better. People who have done co-parenting for a substantial amount of time. We want children to go home to their birth parents. We want their birth parents to be able to care for them. And again, if I could see you, which I can't, I know there are people here who are working so closely with birth parents every day, who are educating them as to how to care for their children better, who are learning from the birth parents how to make the transition better, and then who maintain relationships for the rest of their lives. This is another point. The case may end, but as I said, the child's life continues, and maintaining relationships beyond when the system is involved can only happen by having these excellent teams and respecting 
you all know my issue, respecting the interests of the caregiver consistently across time. You know, Grayson, I, I would want to say, though, that it, it is a, you know, we often think about some of these things as kind of a one-time event, and, and kind of to Carol's point, it, it really is a process. And, you know, we have to, at the very beginning, uh, even to, to the judge's point, it, it, we have to, to plan with the end in mind. Where is it that we're trying to, to go and that we're constantly and consistently talking about that with whomever is involved in and whoever we bring into uh, keeping them involved uh, it, through the process. It, it, it is a process and it will change over time, uh, but it, it, if we keep the end in mind, which is what is in the best interest of this, of this child, sometimes mistakes are made uh, in, in, within the system and then we often get ourselves into a position where we're trying to correct the mistake. And, and, but, but what has already happened is that it, a decision That's has so already true. been made, a relationship has already been formed that is in the best interest of that child. And, and sometimes we have to live with, what I'm gonna say, live with the mistake because it's in the best interest of the child to do so. Uh, so, you know, it's, I mean, this is a, a complex, complicated, uh, discussion uh, truly to, to, to have and there but the idea for me is that that I want to make sure that we're communicating is that these are individual decisions these are individual children or sibling groups that we have to be thinking about uh, in, in, in thinking through those decisions as opposed to these kind of rote um, understandings of, of, of how we should be uh, moving children uh, within a system and I think just to add to that, I mean, historically as a system, we've paid a lot of attention to assessing um, the bond between a child and a parent and enhancing that bond. But I think as we've learned more about um, bonding and child development and the science of all that, we're finally, I think as you're hearing everyone on this panel sort of echo, um, considering more the bonds that they're making while they're in out-of-home care, either with their siblings or with their foster parents, and, and looking at that uh, as more of an individualized thing versus just the parent, the parent and child bond. So um, that's really exciting stuff. I mean, I think this is representative of that. And can I say one? Of course I can. Of course you can. One more thing. <laughs> no, I'm going to stop you. I think one great thing is this panel, Secretary Carol's speech, all of the institutes on attachment, bonding, the science of child development. I feel like there are a lot of practitioners in the audience who are on the line. And to me, I always say, I'm just scared what would happen if this were my children. They'd have such hard decisions to make with such major consequences. I'd be talking to my daughter every single night. And what I think people should feel good about is the department, the CBCs, have your back on this now. They are really trying to say, we're gonna give you the information, we're going to let you be what you came in to be which is people who make professional decisions to help children, not people who only have to make sure they complied with the technical letter of some number, which I know it has 30s and 49 Cs in it. No, <laughs> you, I think that what the department and CBCs are trying to say, having Larita here, and Steve now, is we have your back. We want you to do a great job. We want to give you the support you need. And that is great news. Even Steve, who, who quoted the law to us, you're basically saying, use the law, use the edges of the law, don't let the law use you. Yeah, I think yes. there's a perception that you, your hands are tied, that you have to keep all siblings together and you have to place with relatives whenever they show up. That is not what the law says. The law says, follow the best interest of the child, whatever that may be. We want you to consider relatives, we want you to consider keeping siblings together, but it's not mandatory. I think it's evident with the legislature this year changing the definition of sibling to include psychological siblings. It's not just that DNA relationship anymore. That is a reflection that we want to say, what is best for these kids, what is best for this group, not just are you a relative, um, is this DNA, and that's what you have to do. It's not required. And this circles back to the point I made at the beginning. This is hard. This is not easy. This is a whole new uh, evolving way of looking at things. And the tar when we meet again, this target is going to have moved a little bit. So it's up to all of us to sort of get together and, and talk this out and figure this out and keep the discussion going on where those margins are. 
But uh, like Steve was saying, my, uh, my best friend from growing up was a, a baseball umpire for a while. And I used to ask him about all these rules and the infield fly rule and all this stuff. He's like, well, my favorite rule is rule, I don't know, give me, give me a long statute number. 39.5212R. That rule. I can never remember which one it was. And he's like, it's uh, the umpire will take actions that are in the best interest of fair play in the game. And it's a rule that allows the umpire to do anything he wants. <laughs> you go to second base. What? Go. He could do that to make sure that the, the game was fair, the game was the best for everyone involved. And so to have these laws being tweaked more to give everybody the tools to do this a little bit more and to have people with big gavels that can help you, I think I would want us to all leave encouraged by that idea that you can go out and you can do this. You can get that team member up there. You can make that choice. You can grab the statute and put it away and figure it out. And, and it's exciting to be talking about that. Um, I wanted to thank all of our panelists for being a part of this. I really appreciate it. I'm going to go back down the line one more time so everybody knows who everybody is. I'm not good with titles. They usually just put them up on the screen, so I'm going to read them. But Carol Schofer is the founder of Quality Parenting Initiatives. <laughs> Pause for a pause in each one. Lots of fans. Uh, Stephen Pennypacker, who's the CEO of Partnerships for Families. <laughs> Loretta Shirley, who's with Eckerd, the Chief of Program Services in Florida. Ginger, Gri Ginger Griffith. Give you another name. Ginger Griffith, <laughs> who's the family safety manager from DCF. <laughs> April Lott with Directions for Living, a behavioral health specialist. <laughs> and my new best friend, <laughs> the Honorable <laughs> Catherine Esrig. <laughs> Judge I just want to see me tweak my nose. I'm, yeah, I know. Tweak your nose and, and help me with that parking ticket. Uh, <laughs> Again, my name is Grayson Com. I'm with 10 News, and on behalf of 10 News and all the other uh, G Gannett outlets I mentioned at the beginning, um, we're really proud to be involved in communities across Florida, literally from Pensacola down through Fort Myers and Brevard County and up into Northeast Florida. And so I'm really just so thrilled that I get to come out here and see so many passionate people. Uh, it's a powerful time. So thank you. I want to invite the Secretary of the Department of Children and Families, Mike Carroll, up for a final talk. Am I on? Oh. Good morning, everybody. So, so, so you made it through three days. When I started on Wednesday, uh, I said I really was honored and humbled to stand before so many passionate and committed folks, and uh, it's no different today. I can't be prouder. Most of these folks I've known for a long time. Uh, they're colleagues, but they're also friends, and uh, they represent the type of passion, the type of commitment, the type of talent, quite frankly, that exists around this state at every level of our uh, child welfare system. And I can't be proud of to be colleagues and friends with these folks. And when folks say that people in the system don't care, I'd like to introduce you to these folks and then all of the folks in the audience because we don't always get it right. And, I want, and that's okay. We need to work uh, hard to get it right. But don't say we don't care because you cannot work this job and not care. I also was struck by the first film clip, and I don't know the foster parent that spoke, but boy, I have empathy for her. What we ask foster parents to do in our system is we put kids in their care, kids who've been traumatized, kids who have been through sometimes significant abuse and neglect, and we ask these families to open their hearts and open their homes, and we ask them to bring these children in and love them like their own. It's not a motel, we're not, we're, we're not buying a room. We're putting kids into a family and we ask foster parents to open their hearts and open their homes and love these kids as their own. And when they do that, and they do it right, guess what? When we get it wrong, they get angry. They should get angry, so we want them to do. We want them to be fierce advocates for the kids that we put in their care because that's what we would do for our own kids. That's exactly what we ask our foster parents to do. And sometimes when they do it, and they do it really well, we say, these foster parents are kind of pains in the neck, right? We want you to be pains in the neck. 
because you are the folks that are with our kids 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. You are the first line for treatment to our kids because it's through your love uh, every day being with these kids that you begin to help them heal. Uh, and so I, my hat's off to you. Our challenge in this state is we need more of you because we have uh, too many kids in this home that need a loving home, and so we need so many more of you. The last thing, and I, and I hope that this is, if there's one thing you remember from this conference, one thing is that this work is all about the best interest of kids. We share a mission in this room, and it's to protect kids. We're in the business of saving lives. And I said it yesterday, and I'll say it again. Saving lives is not just about reducing preventable child fatalities with families that we work with. That's a given. That's an expectation. We have to do that. Saving lives is about the kids you interact with every day, and you see it when they come in. These kids are so special, so unique. There's something inside them that makes them special. And it's your job to keep that light that exists inside them burning brightly. And my challenge to you, my challenge to you, is when you go back to work on Monday and you start interacting directly with families and kids again, that every decision you make, every action you take, every intervention you decide uh, to put into place, the child ought to be at the forefront of that, and the child's best interest ought to be at the forefront of it. And I hope, as you're going through that decision-making process, you think about whether your actions are going to contribute to help make that light in every child we deal with glow brighter, burn brighter, or whether even with the best of intentions, we follow what we sometimes think is the law, or we follow what we think is bureaucratically uh, required of us, but has the effect of dimming that light. We should never be the folks. We should never be the folks of dimming that light. We're in the business of helping that light burn bright. And remember that in all your decision making. If we do that, I think we get better outcomes for kids. The other thing, I just had a uh, meeting. Yesterday we met with the Florida Youth Leadership Academy, the kids that graduated, extraordinary group of young folks. I met with the folks from Youth Shine, uh, folks who have uh, come through our system. Some uh, are still, uh, I, uh, I met a number of them that had not turned 18 yet, but most of these kids are already past the age of 18, and almost every one of them I talked to was in college and had grand plans, just like all of our kids, right? I know when I was young, they used to call me, and this is no disrespect, Representative Harold, but they used to call me Senator Carroll when I was young. <laughs> now, problem is I can't get elected, but I like the title, right? Kids have big dreams. These kids have big dreams. And so it's so nice to see that these kids came through extraordinary challenges that some of us will never know. And yet that light is still burning and they still have big dreams. And that's kind of cool. We have this thing, can, can you bring me that little sign there? <coughs> You're gonna see this starting. I don't have the socks on today. I won't show you what kind of socks, but it can be done. If you didn't have a chance to meet the kids uh, from the Florida uh, Leadership Academy or Youth Shine, I challenge you to go meet them because they're proof positive that it can be done, the work that we do can help it get done, and I challenge folks who aren't in our business, the business world, take a chance on our kids, hire them, give them a job. In the education field, take a chance on them, let our kids go to school. You will be amazed if you take a chance on our kids, what they can do, because they're full of hope, full of promise, and, and, and it will be a great decision on your part. So I really do thank you for coming. Now, indulge me for one minute. Uh, it's not often I get that. And by the way, the set's up here. Somebody told me they saw me on TV and it looked like The Tonight Show because I had a band behind me. It was kind of cool, <laughs> right? And my mom lives up in Boston. And I grew up in the projects, and she called me right after I left, and because uh, um, it streamed on Florida Channel, and I and thank you to the Florida Channel for being here. And uh, I started in the projects. My mom is still friends with a couple of the ladies that were our neighbors, 
and they came up, they actually watched it together. And uh, so I got a call from a three 78 year old women who said, oh my God. And they all loved my shoes. <laughs> Apparently that was the big hit on TV. <laughs> right? But um, when I got thrust into this role as secretary, I, I, I was a bit nervous, you know. Um, I had lots that I thought I could contribute. Uh, but I said at the beginning of this week that no one does this work alone, and, and I don't either. And I have an extraordinary group of folks that work for the Department of My Leadership team that has made this so easy for me. And I would like to recognize a couple of them uh, before I go, because uh, they would kill me if I didn't. But Jane Johnson is my chief of staff. As she likes to put it, she keeps me out of trouble. You know, when I walk through a lawn, if there's dog poop there, I'll step in it. Her job <laughs> is to make sure I don't, right? <laughs> Pete Degree is uh, the deputy secretary. <laughs> we in the department refer to Pete as the professor. I have never met a more learned man around child welfare and child welfare issues uh, than Pete. I don't want to call Pete old, although he is old. He's older than me. Uh, but this man continues to read. He continues to uh, go to, um, he probably went to more workshops this week than some of you, shame on you, right? Uh, but, but to me, he's a, he's, a, he's a role model for continued learning uh, because it never stops. My uh, general counsel, Rebecca Capusta, used to be my attorney at Suncoast, and now she's our attorney here, and I think has done great work early on. And the foster parents in the system are gonna love her because uh, we are gonna be much more aggressive at making sure that we um, um, prevent some of the issues that you saw on the film strip related to movement and, and calling that within the law. Um, Alexis Lambert, communications manager. They did a lot of the PSAs. I, we, we, we put out some excellent PSAs that are going to try, hopefully, uh, get our arms around some of the issues we have with child fatalities in this state. And, and, and I said it before, when I came in, my, my local press was, was very favorable to me. We had a much different relationship. But one of the shocks for me was uh, how I be. I don't think I became a different person, but boy, if I read the newspaper, I certainly did. So uh, they've been very helpful to me. And where my child welfare team, we introduced JT the other day. Janice Thomas is an extraordinary woman. She's the assistant secretary for child welfare. Very humble. South Alabama, North Florida accent. Don't mistake in that for a woman who is not tough, sharp. She knows child welfare. And she's put together an extraordinary team. Joshanda Garrier, uh, Kelly Sweat, uh, and Tracy Levine. And together I call them the four-headed monster, but they have done uh, some extraordinary work for us. Uh, so I thank my team. The one other thing before you go. One of my first things when I became secretary, I was asked by Pat Badland, well, what do you want to do at the summit? I said, well, I usually sit in the audience. What do you mean what do I want to do? <laughs> uh, this woman has planned all of these summits through the years, and it's not an easy task. And this year, we had just short of 2,700 people. And I can't tell you how many hours went into preparing uh, what I thought went fairly uh, seamless and transparent uh, this week. Uh, and I know that she teamed with a lot of you folks uh, in the room, particularly from the CBC uh, side of the house, to make this happen. But I want Pat to come up on stage. Yes. Pat has done this every year, and nobody ever sees her. So, so for people on TV, this is Pat Badland. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. Thank you, folks. We do have one more uh, uh, breakout session. It's a community-level uh, planning session. Please take advantage of the session because no pressure, but when you go back to work on Monday, we have high expectations for the work you do. Thank you.